Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all staying warm, especially those in the southern United States without power. On behalf of the Academy of Therapy Wisdom, welcome to our first live webinar series with Dr. Janina Fisher. Today is our first live webinar, Healing the Fragmented Self After Trauma, which will be followed next week, our second web webinar, Stabilize the Unstable, and that's next Thursday, February 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and everybody on the call will get an email with coordinates how to join us. Um, while we wait a few moments for folks to join us, I invite participants on Zoom to share and chat where you're calling in from, and if you could, what attracted you to the series. I'm just going to Zoom to see who's in there. Mm -hmm. Brazil, Raleigh, New Mexico, Toronto. Oh my God, I can't even. Jerusalem. Austin, Rhode Island. You're going so That's fast. wonderful. Oh my God. Very it's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's truly a global event. My name is Brian Spielman and I'm the founder of the Academy of Therapy Wisdom. So glad to have you here. We have professionals from 95 countries from around the globe today, um, throughout South America, Africa, Europe, Australia, Asia, and North America. At Therapy Wisdom, we're interested in bringing you wisdom teachers and experts that live at the intersection of psychotherapy, spirituality, and social change. And with that, I think Janina is one of the true gems in the field. And you, if you're just joining us, you're in good technical hands today with our webinar manager, Felix, that many of you heard on previous calls. And as Felix said in the beginning, if you have questions for Janina during the call, click the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your question there. And if you want to join the call to ask a question live to Janina, you may click raise hand. And don't forget to have your mic and camera ready. And little reminder, we are recording this webinar so folks can listen to later on. It's my great honor today to welcome and introduce Dr. Janina Fisher. Janina is a licensed clinical psychologist and instructor at the Trauma Center, an outpatient clinic and research center founded by Bezel van der Kolk. She is a faculty member at the Sensory Motor Psychotherapy Institute and a former instructor at Harvard Medical School. She is the author of three books, Healing the Fragmented Self of Trauma Survivors. Many of you probably have seen this book. Highly recommend it. She co-authored with Pat Ogden, Sensory Motor Psychotherapy, Interventions for Attachment and Trauma, and her forthcoming book, Working with the Neurobiological Legacy of Trauma. Many more words can be said about Janine's credentials, but what I'm most impressed with is her warmth, tremendous energy, and dedication to giving hope and clear methods to work with clients whose society as often ignored or considered untreatable. So please welcome Janina and touch that we have such a large platform here to share her words. Yeah. So thank you, Janina. Thank you, Brian. I am so excited that there's so many of you joining us from literally around the world. Uh, just a reminder that if you have questions about your technical issues, questions about getting handouts or getting the recording. Uh, put those in the chat so they'll be seen by our tech support team. And if you have questions for me that are more clinical, uh, put them in the Q&A box. So let me go ahead and start because we just have an hour today, but luckily uh, an hour coming up on the 25th as well. So let's talk about fragmented selves. Uh, you know, the word dissociation, I can remember from the earliest days in the trauma field was a bad word. And so was the term borderline splitting. And so all these years, the 30 years I've been in the trauma field, the 40 years I've been a therapist, there hasn't really been a good language to describe a particular group of clients. And what we know about this group of clients, whatever their diagnosis, is that the vast majority 
suffered some type of abuse or traumatic neglect in childhood. And that sets up a terrible internal struggle for children, for any human being, because we all have an instinct, an automatic instinct to seek our loved ones when we feel in danger. But for children of abuse, the source of safety is the source of danger. And so children are caught in this internal battle between the need for connection and the need for safety. And, and it is a terrible, a terrible, tragic situation. The other thing that happens in the context of trauma is various mental mechanisms, brain mechanism, that allow us to get distance from overwhelming events. Think, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, doesn't have the capacity to tolerate events that would overwhelm an adult. So we need psychological distance to survive without actually going crazy. And especially for developing children, a sense of self has to be kept separate from the trauma. We all know what happens to clients whose sense of selves become inextricably linked to how they were treated. We've all heard clients describe the disowning of this abused, wounded, bad child. They say, I floated up to the ceiling and watched what was happening from above. I watched what was happening to that other child. Sometimes they say, I pretended to be asleep. Sometimes they say, I blacked out. I don't remember what happened. And all of those describe what I'm going to call today fragmenting. We've called it dissociation for many, many decades. But dissociation has a whole host of meanings that has made it a very unpopular word. So let's normalize it. Let's think about how that young child needs to fragment so that after the abuse, there is at least part of the child that can get up and go about being a child. And very, very conveniently, if we disown the traumatized part of us, we also disown what happened so that it becomes easy to say to a therapist years later, oh, my parents weren't abusive. It wasn't so bad. I wouldn't call it trauma. And then, of course, smoke starts to come out of the therapist's ears, even though we can't express it because we see the minimization as if the whole of the client is denying what happened. But actually what the client is expressing is the way that this fragmentation and self-alienation allows the client to say, it wasn't so bad. While the other side of the client told how bad it was. Here are some of the signs that individuals are suffering from the many ongoing results of having to be alienated from themselves. You know these clients, I'm sure as well as I do. Clients who are filled with self-hatred, self-doubt, self-judgment, who attack every shred of self-esteem that they feel and have no ability to take in contradicting information. Information that says, 
other people value you as good. Terminal ambivalence is a term that I made up to describe the client who gets stuck, who wants help, but can't change, wants help, but can't try something new, can't make decisions, small or large, and clients who engage in what we call self-sabotage, as if they make the decision to sabotage themselves. In my way of thinking, part of them wants to go forward. Another part holds them back or sabotages their attempts. The clients that try the souls of most therapists who are numb, disconnected, and in their heads. But conversely, the clients whose emotions are constantly gushing, that are overwhelming to the client, sometimes overwhelming for the therapist, the clients who have no ability to find soothing or places inside that are not in pain. Now, clients with addictions, eating disorders, who act out, um, who help burn and try to kill themselves. I believe that all self-destructive behavior is a manifestation of self-alienation. And then think about clients with whom you often feel very confused because their responses are contradictory. They present one way one week and the next week um, in a completely different way. One week they're trying their hardest to live. The next week they're on a self-destructive course. One week they feel afraid. The next week they feel enraged. Regressive or aggressive behavior without ownership. We can all say, I really, I really, I was really pretty aggressive in that situation. I was really out of line. That's ownership. We all lose our tempers, right? We all have times when we're more dependent, needy, lost, but, but we own it. We say, you know, I was completely lost and I was looking to everyone for help. The clients who are fragmented go into these aggressive or regressive states without awareness that that's what's happening. And I have to remember a client whose tendency was with aggressive state while she, her, her, prefrontal cortex kept saying, I'm a very spiritual person, but um, because I don't think she was aware of the intensity of the anger. Dissociative disorders, obviously manifestations of fragmentation, but also personality disorders. The most pathologized diagnosis in the all of the mental health world. Very important to see personality disorders as manifestations of self-alienation. So I'm going to share with you the theory that, that for me makes the most sense of clients who fit this description, trauma survivors, who have struggled with these difficulties for often years, if not decades. And if the model that I'm using is the structural dissociation model of Arno van der Hart, Hillert Mandus, and Kathy Steele. Um, I first heard them speak on this model in probably 1998. And immediately it made sense to me. Because what they say is 
dissociation is, is a mental ability. It's a mental, um, like so many mental abilities we have, that are not conscious for us. We don't, we don't say, I'm going to dissociate now. <clears throat> but we've all probably experienced what we call highway hypnosis, where we dissociate in the midst of a long drive and still somehow end up at our destination. What they say is that the brain presents us with fault lines for dissociation. We actually don't have one brain. That's, that's how we talk about it. But the brain is composed of lots of small structures, some bigger, some smaller, that communicate via neural networks. It lends itself perfectly to dissociation and fragmentation. So the theory says that when we are traumatized, <clears throat> the left brain part of our personalities becomes more divided and alienated from the right brain part of the personality. And that's what allows children, victims of domestic violence, veterans in combat, um, you know, nowadays, people in a world of COVID, um, people in war-torn countries, it allows part of the personality to keep on keeping on, to keep doing what we all do to make our lives run in the course of the day, to care for the young, to make sure we have a roof over our heads, food, and warmth in the winter. And we just, we've all experienced that in times of personal loss, illness, uh, family tragedies. As therapists, we carry on. And, and our clients are shielded from the right brain part of our personalities that holds the emotions, holds the survival responses, holds the emotional memories. And what the right brain also does is it remains on guard for the next and the next and the next trauma. Because since the time of primitive men and women, we've always lived in a world where traumatic events happen day after day after day after day. And very sadly, although our world has become uh, much more complex and sophisticated, that risk of or traumatic threat day after day after day is certainly with us in this time. Now, I had a problem with the language because the authors of this brilliant theory called the left brain part of the personality the apparently normal part. And that disturbed me because that seemed to underscore my clients' beliefs that they were faking it, that they were pseudo selves, um, and that anything positive they did was merely a false front. So I changed the language a little bit. I named the left brain part of the personality, the going on with normal life part, to really represent that keeping on, keeping on is not easy and it's not safe, right? When you, when you are, for example, grieving a loss and you pick yourself up and you make dinner for the family, or you go to work, or you take a shower, that takes courage, that takes strength. That is not faking it. And I 
called the right brain part of the personality, the traumatized part, because I wanted to help my clients to have a relationship to that trauma that for the left brain part of the personality wasn't such a big deal. But for the right brain side was a life altering, overwhelming experience. And I found that actually this language worked. The clients who rejected the idea that they had ever done anything authentic or, or normal in their lives would agree that they had kept on keeping on. And it was easier that for them to relate to the trauma if they understood it as being held by that other side of the personality. Many people ask me, well, what about integrating the two? And what I say is that we can't integrate the two if the client is saying, oh, nothing much happened. It really, I don't know why you're making such a big deal of this. Right? That's not the first thing the client has to do is have a way to relate to the impact of what happened. I don't care if the client relates to the event, but I do need the client to be able to relate to the impact. Right? There's a reason why I'm afraid at night. There's a reason why I don't trust people. And so here is the result of a fragmented self. Who, who am I in the light? You know, if you think about the, the life of someone who has these kinds of splits, there's all that normal life to keep on keeping on with interspersed with feeling overwhelming, excruciating shame, inexplicable fear, um, automatic impulses to pull back, isolate, fight, flee. It's very, very confusing. And so it becomes hard to know what's real, the keeping on, keeping on, or the huge emotions and physical impulses. This is Annie. And this question, who am I, was a question that plagued her for decades. As you can see, she has a very normal life. She's sitting in her back garden um, on a homemade swing set that she and her husband cobbled together, looking out over the river that flows through her backyard. And you might notice her dog at her feet. It's a beautiful, peaceful fall day. But for much of her adult life, it didn't feel like her life. It didn't feel real that she owned this home on the river that she'd been married for 30 plus years, that she had friends and neighbors and family of choice. What felt real was this. She said, I hear the voices of crying children. Dr. Dr. Yes. Fisher, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, Janina. Um, yes. um, I'm getting a little bit of um, feedback that you're a little bit hard to hear. Would you mind speaking up a little bit? Oh, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We have to have people able to hear us from tens of thousands of miles away. So I will speak up. Sorry about that, everyone. And I'm just actually going to move my computer a little closer so I'm closer to the microphone. So what felt real to Annie was her inner life. She said, I hear the voices of crying children. 
screaming in my head and a sense of shadowy figures who keep me tied up and will not let me live my life. Very confusing. This was the life she lived every day. This is the life that felt real. The person she felt herself to be had failed at life, was constantly overwhelmed, filled with self-doubt and filled with self-hatred and unable often even to leave the house. We, we, we joke, used to joke that her parts kept her on house arrest. Now, with more trauma comes more dissociation, right? I, I remember having a conversation with Annie. She said, why is this taking so long? Why, why are there so many parts? And I said, we all have as many parts as was needed to survive and adapt to whatever. And so with more trauma, more neglect, more family violence, obviously more fragmentation is necessary, but the theory says the splitting is along the lines of the animal defense survival responses, which are part of our birthright. We all have that impulse, that instinct to cry for help. It's the first defense of little babies. We all have a fight impulse, even if we've never fought. We all have an impulse to flee, an impulse to fear or freeze. And we all have an impulse to submit. Um, when we are trapped and there is no way out, which unfortunately is the case for children. Children are trapped until they are old enough to have effective fighting and fleeing responses, which is not until the teenage years. So here's how I understand it. Each part comes to yeah, I thought that it comes to our offices, but of course, in this in this time of COVID, we don't always have people coming to our office. We rarely have people coming to the office, but we do have people coming to see us. And often, what presents is a client in the going on with normal life self with the defensive strategy of that part, I have to function. I can't afford to get too emotional because I have to pick up the children from school. I can't afford to think about the trauma because I have a meeting at work this afternoon. Often, these are clients who come with many questions and complaints about their day-to-day -day lives. Sometimes the therapist feels a little frustrated. When are we going to actually work on something deeper? Sometimes the client comes in a state of fear or freeze. And I have to remember the defensive strategy of the fear or freeze part is to evoke the sense of alarm in the body. That's what fear does. It's like, it's like an alarm system that says, watch out, watch out, you're in danger. Sometimes the cry for help part presents, usually as very vulnerable, very emotional, very sad, um, and very very needy for a connection with the therapist. Often, we're very happy to meet the cry for help part because we want to help. 
And because the cry for help card has access to vulnerability. Um, sometimes it's the, the mid part that comes to therapy, usually presenting with chronic depression, shame, low self-esteem, hopelessness, helplessness, and a passivity, um, shut down inability to really engage. Because if you think, what a submission involves? Submission requires that we go limp, that we lose all of our energy, that we numb out. And so the submission response comes with numbing, disconnection, low energy, and passivity. Maybe the client comes with the slight part. You know, often the slight parts don't stay in therapy. I'm sure you've all had clients who came for a session or maybe two and then just never came back. Or they come for a few sessions and then they miss several sessions and then they come back and they got one foot in and one foot out. That's the flight part. But also another way to flee is through addictive and eating disordered behavior. Because substance abuse involves an array of substances that can increase energy, that can numb us out, um, eating disordered behavior, whether restricting in anorexia or binging and purging or overeating, all function to numb the body. It's very convenient. And then we have the fight part, the only animal defense associated with aggression. And so, the fight part is associated with anger, with violence toward others, but also violence toward self. Self-harm, suicidality, often um, self-destructive behavior that is not um, suicide-oriented but is very dangerous, very important in the therapeutic relationship. The fight part is the hypervigilant, mistrustful part. The fight part simply avoids us. Um, the fight part is openly mistrustful and often um, very resistant to treatment because it seems to involve vulnerability and trust. So, that's our cast of characters. And this is the cast of characters that we see when clients come with a borderline diagnosis or come with a narcissistic personality disorder diagnosis, come with a complex PTSD diagnosis, come because of an eating disorder and addiction um, self-harm, suicidality, uh, chronic depression, uh, chronic anxiety. All, we see those clients every day in our practices. You, you know the estimates are that 30 to 40 percent of all outpatients have histories of trauma, and an estimated 70% of all inpatients. The problem that we have to help people with is that the parts perceive the world as dangerous. There is no sense that it's over. In my, in my new book, I write about this. It's a phenomenon that really just came to me fairly recently, that for our trauma survivors, time stops 
in the middle of the event. They don't have a sense of a beginning, a middle, and an over. They have very little sense of, oh, I survived. They're still feeling afraid, ashamed, um, angry but powerless, uh, and still heightened um, responses to anything that, that the body, not the mind, anything that the body perceives as dangerous. And I really appreciate this insight from Martin Piker, who is a brain researcher, but from his study of traumatized children and adolescents, he has noted, if an individual is born into a malevolent and stress-filled world, it is crucial for survival that he, she maintain a state of vigilance and suspiciousness that enables him to readily detect danger. He will need the potential to mobilize an intense fight-flight response and to react aggressively to challenge in order to facilitate survival. And we, we see that in our clients. They come for help, but at the same time, that state of vigilance and suspiciousness comes with them. As much as they want our help, their bodies react aggressively to challenge. And then he goes on to say, these animal defense survival responses markedly augment the individual's capacity to rapidly and dramatically shift into an intense aggressive state when threatened by danger or loss. Very, very important because we often forget that for trauma survivors, for traumatized children, loss is as big a threat as as physical violence. And so loss, subtle thing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I'm actually thinking of patients in hospitals um, who have had these rapid and dramatic shifts into an intense aggressive state when a favorite staff member um, left the hospital, moved to a different unit went out on maternity leave. Um, so the loss doesn't have to be a bereavement. It doesn't have to be a devastating loss. Loss or the threat of loss, even something as simple as the ending of the therapy hour, may be enough loss to trigger these intense states. And what threatens stability, and we're going to talk more about, about the stabilizing the unstable in our next webinar. Being fragmented does not cause instability. What causes the instability is the inherent conflict between these different survival responses. So. For example, vulnerability, asking for help, becoming attached to one therapist is in direct competition to the instinct to flee or fight or resist or control the treatment. So often I can think of a client where I just thought, okay, we're making some progress here. And then the very next session, um, that sense of therapeutic alliance breaks down. Often, the willingness to work with us is interpreted as submission by fight and flight parents. 
And so, again, often there's a struggle between the wish for help and the ability to accept help. Often clients express a wish to trust, but always that wish to trust is in conflict with the hypervigilance and mistrust. Wanting to be sober is in conflict with the instinct to regulate overwhelm through substance abuse. Wanting to live, wanting to avoid suicide is in conflict with the determination of suicidal fight cards to get control over life by having a parachute, by being able to jump out of the plane, so to speak. And so we're always working with these competing responses, complicated by the fact that we're looking at clients on the screen, in person, who are whole bodies with one brain. And when they say, I'm suicidal, we assume that represents the whole person. When they say, I'm depressed, we assume that represents a whole person. And we have to remember that if this client is a trauma survivor, the chances are very high that it's fragmentation. The client's hopelessness is the feeling of one part, but the client has shown up for therapy, which means there's another part that hasn't given up hope. And that can be very hard for the therapist to remember, much less the client. Annie says it very well. She says the problem is that each part is still trying to fix it in her own way. And I remember asking her, fix what, Annie? And she said, Fix what was wrong then. These parts are still in the trauma, even if the client has gone on to live a very healthy, normal, productive life. So I'm going to end with this cartoon that really expresses the approach we're going to take in these webinars. The doctor says, basically, there's nothing wrong with you that what's right with you can't cure. That's the belief I'm bringing in to this way of working. That every part has something right with it. That fragmentation has something right with it that the going on with normal life self, no matter how depleted, no matter how convinced that he, she, they are a false self, there is so much that's still right with our clients that we can use to help them heal what's wrong. So let us, Take some questions because this is really, really what I think is so uh, wonderful about being able to have webinars in the middle of a pandemic is that we can talk to each other. So let me take uh, uh, some of the questions that have come up, and there are many, 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 many. And I can't, I would love to be able to answer as many of them as I can. I'll try. I've never met a short answer, but I'm going to try. Uh, Stuart says, can you say something about psychosis and self-alienation? Yes, you know, the research in the last five to 10 years on the, on the association between psychotic disorders and trauma has been very shocking. The statistics are 
that trauma is highly associated with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. So therefore, let's assume that it has to include self-alienation. Also, we know that many trauma clients are misdiagnosed as psychotic because they hear voices. Um, despite the fact that we have research showing voices being reported by combat veterans, by clients with borderline personality disorder, even in a normal university sample, so we have some clients who are really trauma clients with psychosis diagnoses. So thank you, Stuart, for raising that because I think it's something for all of us to keep in mind. <laughs> um, Marina Rodriguez, bless you, Marina, for saying this. The focus on clients reinforces the fragmentation between us and them. Many therapists are also clients. We are talking about people who sometimes might be therapists as well. And this needs to be acknowledged, absolutely. And thank you so much for, for making that request. Years ago, probably six or eight years ago, I remember I put out a, an invitation um, to a group of 200 therapists at a workshop in London, uh, I said, any of you who had secure attachment as a child and still went on to become a therapist, please see me at the break. One person came to see me at the break. I put out this invitation many, many times, probably to thousands of therapists in total. I've had about 10 who have said, I had a safe, normal, secure attachment in childhood, and I still decided to become a therapist. Uh, yes, we are them and they are us for sure. Um, let's see. Um, so here, <laughs> um, Here's a, a wonderful example of a problem that we encounter a lot from Iwa, and please forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Hello, I have a patient with hidden trauma. Uh, she doesn't want to remember abuse from childhood. Um, client has a problem showing any emotion, but mostly anger. Have impression that the therapy is stuck. Uh, the patient doesn't want to touch any part of emotion far away to the point that she can talk about the trauma. What are my suggestions? So immediately, thank you for that, because immediately I think, okay, no emotions other than anger allowed. That's the fight part. The client has come to therapy most, most likely the normal life self. And, um, and this phobia of emotion has to be acknowledged as normal. So I ask clients it, to, and just, I just see a lot of questions coming up in the chat box. Remember, I don't get to see the chat box. If your question is in the chat box, I will never see it. And I'll be sorry about that. So make sure you put your, your clinical questions in the Q&A box. Um, so this is a client whose fight part is in control. Um, and I would probably ask that client, was it ever safe to have emotions in childhood? So I'm not asking for details of traumatic events. I'm saying, was it safe in your family to have emotions? Most clients tell me, no, it wasn't safe. Which emotions were the most unsafe? And, and then 
I can say, well, no wonder your mind and body do not let you feel those emotions that were unsafe then. I don't need to talk about traumatic events with clients. Um, in fact, I, I don't believe that's the answer. I think that um, what we've learned in the last 10 years about trauma really tells us that we have to work with the nonverbal memories rather than the event memories. Um, but that, that's a question for a much longer, that's a, probably a whole webinar in itself. Um, well, here's a wonderful question. What advice would you give to well-trained therapists who've been dedicated for 20 years to doing their own work and feel ashamed of their own structural dissociation that comes out in their personal lives under extreme stress, which of course is natural. And what the advice I would give is to wear it proudly, that that structural dissociation helped you to survive. I say this to clients all the time. I say, had you not been able to fragment, if you hadn't been able to dissociate, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. So we should be thanking, be thanking the fragmented parts for allowing you to make it. And I think it's very important very important to understand that life is triggering no matter how much work we have done the body and the brain remain sensitive to triggers because that's what that means that we err on the side of reacting to a possible threat rather than non-reacting again i see some questions coming up in the chat box, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, Crystal Robertson asks, is it possible for trauma to manifest into physical diagnoses such as seizures? Absolutely, the dissociative disorders literature is full of, um, of papers about dissociation and Pseudo seizures, dissociation, and tics and twitches. We have a, a whole literature on the association between trauma and a compromised immune system. Um, so, absolutely. And, and, you know, the thing that's to me that is exciting about the work that I've developed that I call trauma-informed stabilization treatment is that it's designed for some of the clients that you all are talking about in your question. Clients who are too overwhelmed to think clearly, who can't go inside because inside is such a chaotic and frightening place. Um, clients who have very, very frightening parts, parts that frighten others, but parts that also frighten the client. Um, I had clients who are so, I would call it hijacked, so identified with parts that attack them and judge them. Uh, these are all the kinds of clients for whom I designed trauma-informed stabilization treatment or is. Oh, let's see, we have, let me see what, here's a question. So up from Aprajita in India, <clears throat> she says, uh, I want to ask, at times when adolescents start having blasphemous, blasphemous thoughts, post-sexual trauma, 
which are prolonged and repetitive. How do we manage it? Um, I think so. Blas I, blasphemous thoughts. Um, I'm assuming um, by that you mean um, self attack um, or highly sexualized or or sadistic sexual uh, kinds of thoughts. I. Oh, that those are clients for whom I would use this model. And I would talk about the part that is trying to keep them hypervigilant. So, you know, intrusive images, flashbacks, um, um, shaming, humiliating thoughts, all are ways that keep the body on guard and hypervigilant. Um, so that's my guess that you're looking at manifestation of hypervigilance. Um, Francesca raises the question, do you need trauma to suffer from self-alienation? You know, there are many kinds of self-alienation. Um, I think the kinds of self-alienation that we're talking about today are, in my experience, are found in traumatized individuals, as opposed to what we used to call normal neurotic uh, individuals who have, I mean, is there anybody here, raise your hand if you have never had self-critical thoughts. I think most of us have a critical, judgmental, uh, self-doubting part. And, um, and so whether or not we've suffered trauma, the intensity and the fragmentation um, is different with trauma. So, Oh my goodness, such amazing questions. Um, and, uh, you know, all of these, there's so many amazing cases that you all are sharing. Um, and what I would suggest, uh, I mean, I'd suggest come back for the next webinar, but also, um, think about introducing this model to some of those clients that you're asking about. Because my experience has been that often clients feel so helped just by having this, this way of thinking about themselves. And especially there's something about the fight, flight, freeze, submit, attach, for survival cards that clients get. And if I show them the model and I say, do any of these parts look familiar to you? I almost never have a meet a client who says, no, none of, I don't know what you're talking about. For the most part, they say, oh, oh, definitely I have them. So um, that will help. Um, so many, many, many wonderful questions. Um, this, I, I'm just, you're just noticing me freezing because I'm looking at all these wonderful questions and, uh, and I wish we had time to answer all of them, uh, but hopefully we will be back together again. Uh, and I believe it's the 25th uh, for our next webinar, and we'll have a chance to carry on this conversation. Uh, I'm very, very excited to, to be sharing today the, the building blocks of the trauma-informed stabilization treatment model, and I'm really looking forward to next week. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming from all corners of the world.
think we care. Brian, any last words or thoughts? Well, thank you, Gina. That was really informative. And thanks to thousands of people who joined us, you know, here in Boulder, Colorado, it's midday, but for some of you, it might be midnight. So we realize the time difference and we're always struggling between people in Asia and their morning evenings and those in Europe, Africa. Um, so we do our best and we will have a replay with captions in the next 48 hours. Felix will be working on that. And then you're automatically enrolled for the, comp for the webinar next Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Pacific time, and we'll, we'll give you a timetable in the next email. So just stand by, look for your email or your Zoom link and backup system to watch it. So thank you all. Much love and stay warm. Yes. Take good care. Bye-bye.